Well, hello again. Welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations uh, video. My name's Graham. We're here at Turin Airport in uh, northwestern Italy. X-Plane 10, and we're going to be flying the IXEG 737-300. Here she is here. It's a lovely uh, spring morning. We parked on stand 108. Sun's just coming up over the horizon, and uh, the aircraft is cold and dark. We'll get the aircraft started up, and... Uh, Fly from here back to London Gatwick. Let's have a look at the aircraft. Well, first things first, we've got a ground power unit plugged in, but the aircraft is entirely switched off. Turn the torch on, a uh, nice feature of X-Plane 10. Before we start the aircraft, uh, put any power to it, we want to do uh, a few basic safety checks on it. Nice and straightforward. Uh, the purpose of my uh, videos is to let you enjoy the aircraft, not necessarily walk through the uh, thing procedures correct, because after all, single pilot ops and it is a flight simulator for recreational purposes. That being said, it's a very detailed model. Let's have a look. So most importantly, uh, we've got the electric hydraulic pumps turned off at the moment. When we apply ground power to the aircraft, it won't pressurize the hydraulic system. That's very much a good thing. All the fuel pumps are turned off, the wipers off and uh, the lights are all selected off at the moment. On the main panel, the gear is uh, selected down, the weather radar is turned off, and the uh, transponder is selected to off. We should be good to apply the power. So on the overhead panel, we'll uh, turn the battery on, close the cover, make sure that uh, on the ground power we've got 400 hertz and uh, 120 volts. With that, we'll connect the ground power. Should be done with the torch, a little bit more light on the aircraft. I'll turn the dome lights on. Because I want to get going as soon as we can, I'll uh, start the IRs aligning straight away. It'll take about seven minutes uh, plus a little bit for those to align. Let's have a look down. Your damper, we can't do that because we don't have any uh, hydraulic energy at the moment uh, coming down here. We do need one of the fuel pumps on. That's the front uh, pump in the left tank to run the APU as well. Uh, in the centre, let's have a look. The most important thing on here is the galley. That makes sure we can get uh, hot tea and coffee uh, as soon as the crew are ready to go. Otherwise, uh, what have we got? We're running on external power in the centre column. We can control the uh, integral lighting on the panel. It's really nice uh, lighting in this model. Uh, emergency exit lights, we'll put those to armed by closing the cap and uh, fasten seatbelt signs. Well, we're going to be uh, refueling the aircraft, so I'll leave those uh, turned uh, off at the moment. We've got about uh, four and a half tonnes on board. That's not going to be really enough, so I'll ask the ground crew to give us uh, six and a half tonnes and uh, start them refueling back to the overhead. So the uh, fasten seatbelt sign is uh, turned off at the moment. What we can turn on however are the uh, window heat controls. That keeps the uh, windows from icing up on the, on the outside, keeps them from frosting up on the inside and also makes them a little bit more flexible for all the uh, pressurization cycles we're going to put them through as well. Leave the PTO on static heats till we're taxiing out. Uh, leave the hydraulic pumps until we're uh, sure the ground crew are clear. Test the CVR up here, well, it's about 18 degrees in the cabin. It's not overly warm, but not cold either. I'll put the recirculation fans on. Uh, packs are off at the moment. Uh, bleeds are selected on, APU bleed is off for the APU start. That's all sensible. Pressurization controller we'll come back to, but it's in ground at the moment. Across the bottom, we want some lights for our colleague to go out and do the walk around. So I'll put the logo lights on, the position lights, and the wheel well lights. On the center panel, uh, there's not really much to uh, not much to do on this at the moment. We'll set the bugs, check the instruments when it all uh, it all lines up. I'll just get rid of that master caution just now. We'll come back to that in a second. On the panel here, we've got uh, the decision height. We'll get rid of that. It's uh, it's nice uh, conditions today. I don't expect to do anything other than a Cat 1 ILS uh, as we arrive back at Gatwick. I'll get the decision height down to minus 20. Uh, if you're doing uh, Cat 1 approaches, it's a barometric decision altitude. Uh, when it's uh, below that, we use the decision height off the uh, red alts. Otherwise, the aircraft's all nicely set up, the IRs are aligning. Let's just uh, have a quick check on the outside. There we go, we've got the nav lights on, wheel wheel lights are on, and the logo lights are on. So at this point, our colleague will be doing a, a walk around on the aircraft. We'll get uh, loading the uh, systems up. First and foremost, it's uh, version 1.04 of this uh, flight sim model running. That's the current release version at the moment. ARAC data is uh, a little bit old. Uh, 
September from last year. However, it's uh, good enough for what we need today. And it's in sync on both boxes, which is the most important thing. Uh, we need to align the IRs. Uh, we could get that from the uh, airfield charts. We could get it. Some airfields, they've got a little uh, plate with the uh, parking stand number on it out there. That would have the position on it occasionally. Um, but today, we've got absolute luxury on this 737. I've got GPS system. So I'll pick that up from there, drop it in there, and that should start the IRs aligning. Everything else is, uh, is looking pretty good. So we need to load a route as well. I'm going to go from uh, Turin, Lima, India, Mike, Foxtrot. Going to London, Gatwick, EG, KK. I'm going to depart off runway 36 at uh, Turin. And our call sign is going to be Reflected Reality Simulations 733. There we go, runway 36. I've never departed off runway 18 at Turin, it's always been landing and uh, taking off on runway 36. It's really quite close into the, the hills, so that kind of explains that. We need to load a route as well. Uh, some companies would have the company routes all saved on the uh, FMS. Other companies you can get it by the data link clearance. For the purposes of today, I'm going to load a really straightforward route. We're going to go to uh, Dijon, Delta Juliet Lima, and Kalumi, Charlie Lima Mike. That'll take us out uh, over uh, towards uh, Mont Blanc and Lake Geneva. Departing uh, runway 36, it will be the Serlo 7 Alpha and uh, Kukev 5 November transition. And the arrival into Gatwick will be the ILS 26 left via the Timba 3 Bravo. Okay, looks good. Let's have a look on here. So Kukev, we'll just join that up. So Kukev goes to Dijon and then Kunav. Uh, is the next point after Columier. Activate the route and uh, the route should all be loaded. One of the things that's important uh, is to make sure the critical data, things that uh, affect your performance off the runway, make sure that's verified by both pilots at the same time. So we'll not uh, do any critical data entry until our colleagues back from doing the walk around. Uh, similar things like air traffic clearances, we get those when both pilots can hear that on the radio. Some uh, Departure routes, they'll have a stop altitude assigned. Uh, for example, coming out of uh, Heathrow, you could stop at uh, 6,000 feet or so on most departures. Other airfields, you get it from air traffic controllers. I think uh, 5,000 feet is uh, quite common at Turin, but uh, today, because we're not using air traffic, I'm going to go straight up to flight level 160, just to make life nice and simple. And again, to cheat a little bit, I'm using a QNH of 1013, so no dramas. Uh, there's no change to make to change to a flight level here. Okay, let's see, how are we getting on with the fueling? That's about uh, three and a half tonnes, and we've got uh, about four minutes to the IRs align. Sounds like a, a good point to start the uh, APU. So, APU, it's uh, in the tail of the aircraft. We don't need to have any uh, ground crew clearance to start the APU. It's uh, quite safe for them to start. Before we do that, we should probably check the, uh, the fire bells on it. So, just double check, all the bells are working, all the lights come on. And on the other side, uh, we'll have a look at the, the lights here as well. It's all behaving itself. Uh, we could also check the uh, cargo smoke detection system, if I've not already done so. There we go, bells on that as well. Okay, let's start the APU. So the pump's on, go to on. Uh, it's going to energize the uh, APU system. I think it opens a little flap to let uh, air in. It certainly does on the, uh, on the Airbus. And then we can go to start. So lower pressure light comes on, the APU is turning. One of the really nice features of this sim is the APU is started electrically. So when it starts to wind up, when the starter is driven, these lights will dim a little bit to signify the extra load on the, uh, on the APU. Uh, on the electrical system, I should say. Okay, so we want to make sure that that APU is looking good before we put it onto the bus. So we'll have a look here. I've got 400 hertz and about 120 volts. So that's pretty good. We should be able to connect it up. Number two bus, first of all, a little bit of current. And the number one bus, much bigger current transfer as well. Uh, because the APU is running quite adequately now, we can uh, open the bleed. We'll look for the air pressure coming up from it. It says dual bleed here. That's because basically APU bleed air can get the engine and engine air can get to the APU. It's fine as long as the engines are at idle thrust. 
and uh, with that I'll turn on one of the packs and it'll start to condition the cabin temperature a little bit. It might be an Airbus thing but once the uh, power transfers happen as well I can turn on the other fuel pumps. Uh, it just minimises the electrical load during the power transfer. We'll tell the ground crew to get rid of the, uh, the ground power cart. So hopefully by this point the, uh, the other pilot uh, has uh, come back to the flight deck so we can load the, uh, the systems up. There's that uh, warning there, that's almost certainly the uh, air conditioning came up there because of the jaw bleed. So let's load the data. So what have we got? Well on the, the route's all loaded, uh, both crews would obviously have checked that through. Uh, let's load the performance. I'm going to cruise at flight level 360 put that in just now. Uh, because it's a, a manual old 737, which is what we love about it, we'll set uh, the altitude on the pressurization controller here as well. It's automatic uh, insofar as you set the cruise altitude, uh, 360, and you set the landing elevation, 200. And on the standby system, we'll have a look at that in the cruise as well. Okay, so we're loading the data. 360 is in there. Uh, from the load sheet, we know we've got a uh, zero fuel weight of... Uh, 40 tons. All looks correct. And reserves, I'll use 1.4 tons. Execute that. On the next page, that's all there. N1 limit. Uh, we're talking about uh, the engine thrust rating at the moment. So you see you've got one of the packs on, one of the packs off, so the engines are slightly different ratings. Uh, what we can do is we can use an assumed temperature. Uh, that actually derates the engines a little bit. In real life, that comes from the performance manual, but here we'll just use a, an estimated 50. It's come down from uh, 92% down to 87 and derated on the climb thrust as well. Load the figures uh, for the takeoff as well. I'll do a flaps 5 a departure. Trim 3.4 versus uh, 3.6. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much what we want. And again, jet performance engineer is quite a complicated subject. In this case, I'll use the QRH figures of 122, 124, and 134. We'll bug that correctly as well. So there's 80 knots for the first check, 210 for the top bug speed. I'm looking for 122. 124 and 134. As well as that, I'll set this speed in here to V2 plus 15, making that 149. Let's have a look. Next thing to do is the thrust reduction altitude. This is the point the uh, auto thrust would bring the uh, thrust back to uh, climb thrust. Some companies use 1500, some use 1000. I'll put 1000 in, uh, and there's uh, different altitudes you can accelerate at as well. We'll have a talk about that during the departure. But for this, that uh, 1000 looks appropriate. So the FMGC should be uh, all loaded up. And we've got a uh, uh, nav display here. HSI is correct. Uh, what we can do is put the flight directors on. And while we're up here, uh, heading. I want to set the runway heading of uh, 360 in there. Just uh, I'll explain that on the taxi. It varies between different 737 versions. One last thing we can do is if we uh, put this onto the plan mode, and I step through the route, you see that uh, we head out towards Surlil before coming back towards the airfield. That gives that altitude to climb I was talking about. Um, if we were to lose that magenta string for some reason, uh, it would be good to have a, a backup to follow on. So first backup, I'll put uh, a fix in for the CSL and radial 104. Uh, if I do that, go back to the legs page, you can see that as we come out towards the Mike Fox uh, 403 and Cerlo, I've got that lovely uh, green line to follow on there. Other thing we could do is uh, chin the Radnaz directly. So CSL 116.75, that's obviously what they were using on the way in uh, last night. 116.75 is there and course of uh, 104. 104. Just to give the first officer something to watch as well, we'll select uh, expanded VOR ILS mode and you can see it come up there. On my side, we'll go back to the map. I love the fact that the uh, machine or the sim shows it down here when you change it. It's really, really quite handy. For the departure, we'll have climb thrust, uh, climb uh, ratings on there and the legs on this side. Last item to bug there would be the uh, acceleration altitude of uh, 2,000 feet. So that's uh, 1,000 feet elevation, 2,000 feet for the axel. Uh, check the data through, make sure we've got it all loaded correctly, and uh, everything's looking good. We're about one minute before scheduled off block. So, I mentioned before that uh, triggers is what we're missing. Usually at this point, we'd know the door was uh, closed, 
on the outside of the aircraft, or the, the dispatch would have come in, taken all the paperwork, uh, closed the door, and we'd have the ground crew buzzing us uh, on the um, on the headset to let us know they're ready. If we don't hear from them, we can push the call button to get the ground crew back again. Um, Fueling's complete, we'll turn the seatbelts on. So once the uh, ground crew are ready, they'll tell us the aircraft uh, is all clear around. There's, uh, there's nobody uh, in the vicinity of the aircraft. With that, we can pressurize the flight controls, turn on the yaw damper, and make sure that all the uh, lights have gone off on that. We then ask air traffic control if we were clear to push and start. If there's any air traffic delays, the uh, would probably hold you off uh, rather than push. In this case, however, we're good to start. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll turn the, set the uh, aircraft up appropriately. We know we've got the uh, pumps on. That's all good. We've got bleed selected. Uh, we're going to start the engine, so turn on the packs off and lights. We'll put the anti-collision light on to let the uh, ground crew know that uh, we're going to start the engines. And on the center panel, turn the transponder on. So if they've got surveillance radar, uh, they can see us on that as well. Ground surveillance radar. Okay, so at this point, we do the uh, checklist, tell the ground crew uh, that we're happy to push. So we'll do a nose left push. They're asking us to release the brakes. I'll turn the uh, parking brake off and we'll start the timer for the block time as well. That's running. Now we're underway. It's uh, appropriate to start the engines. So we'll start the uh, number two engine first. Just verify the configuration here. I've got the packs off. We've got bleeds on and uh, fuel from the pumps. So we use the uh, right ignition. It's the 26 today. So uh, even number, right hand side, and go to ground start. We're looking for the uh, N2 to turn. Start valve's opened. N2 is uh, turning. That's the engine core, followed shortly thereafter by M1. That's the uh, engine fan on the front. Once we get to about 25%, uh, we'll put some fuel in. There's 25%. Fuel coming in. So it's quite common in Italy to uh, push and start before you've got your full departure clearance. They'll sometimes give you the expected routing, but it's very common to push without a transponder or a squat code set on here. We'd usually get that uh, at some point during the push or on the taxi out. Number two started successfully. We'll start the uh, number one. Start valves open. It's uh, turning the core. Waiting for that uh, 25%. There we go. And ground crew asking us to set the parking brake, which I'll do. There we go. Get rid of the ground crew. At this point, air traffic would almost certainly be nagging us with the uh, clearance. So we'll put the uh, transponder code in the us. Let's go with 4561 today, just for, for something to do. We check the routing uh, verifies with uh, what they say and check the stop altitude as well. And the engine's running. We tell the ground crew they are clear to disconnect. I'm just awaiting their, their visual clearance. Now they uh, disconnect the bypass pin and wander off to the right hand side. We've got uh, two engines running, so let's just check the energy being supplied. The electrical energy, 400 hertz and uh, 120 volts, and 400 hertz and 120 volts. Looks good. So we'll put uh, number two generator on, and the number one generator. We can put the pitot uh, heat on at the moment. Uh, we don't need the uh, engine anti-ice today, it's a lovely day. Uh, coming down here, we're finished with APU bleed, and I'll put one of the packs on. That's taking its feed from the, uh, the engine bleed. Pressurization can go to flight and uh, the engine starts, which is back to continuous ignition for the departure. And we are finished with the APU. Coming down here, we want to check the trims. 3.6, set the flaps to flaps 5. And uh, also check that the rudder trim is neutral. Uh, neutral. On the Airbus as well, we'd arm the speed brake by pulling the lever up. On the Boeing, we don't need to do that. Leave it in the detent there. And at this point, we'd uh, run the checklist, make sure everything uh, looks how it should do. Uh, just a quick scan down, see if we've done everything that I should have done. 
Uh, again, this is where having two crew really makes all the difference. It's, it's the really enjoyable part of the operation. Uh, probably done with the dome light now. It's uh, a little bit brighter outside. We've waved bye bye to the ground crew and we're happy to taxi. Get the taxi clearance from air traffic. We'll turn the lights on. I'll take the parking brake off. And off we go. A little bit of power to get it moving, but for the most part you can taxi out with the uh, thrust at idle. So once it's underway, we're there. Do a quick brake check. And then off we go. So this is where the challenges of operating the sim uh, really kick in. On a two crew aircraft, the procedures are written such that it does need uh, both crew members to be actively involved. It's not a, a, a pilot and a sidekick. There are two pilots in the aircraft because it's designed to be flown by two pilots. So on the taxi out, for example, if we're doing a single engine taxi, the pilot monitoring would be starting the other engine. And there's also a, a series of uh, procedures he's got to do as well. What you'd never do is for the pilot flying who's uh, driving the aircraft on the tiller at the moment, uh, he would never take his eye off um, driving the aircraft around. Some 737s uh, only have a tiller on the, the left hand side, in fact this one models that configuration, so it would always be the uh, always be the captain driving the aircraft on the ground and the first officer doing the start. However, for the purposes of the sim, we're more or less straight ahead on the um, taxi out there. So the first officer can go ahead and do his bits and pieces. We'll turn the uh, transponder TCAS to TARA. I'll put the uh, weather radar on and we'll have terrain displayed on the, the, uh, on the nav display. Quick flight control check as well. Uh, serves no purpose in the sim other, one, other than to see if there's any major glitches in your uh, joystick input. That's all good. I said I'd say something about the uh, heading being selected to 360 as well. Depending on how old the uh, 737 in question is, uh, on some of the really old versions, uh, I seem to recall the flight directors will command wings level, uh, whereas some of the uh, more modern ones, like this one simulates, it will fly a heading select. And on the latest NGs, I believe you can arm LNAV on the ground, although that's probably not a good idea in this aircraft. Once we're done the flight controls, I'll set the auto brakes to RTO, making sure the light goes out here. One of the little glitches in this uh, flight uh, simulation model at the moment is if I was to touch the brakes again, that uh, auto brake would disarm. That's not correct, it's not per real life, and I believe it will be fixed in the next uh, patch for the aircraft. But uh, let's work on the basis that we've been handed over from the uh, ground controller to tower. We've got our clearance to take off. So what we'll do is we'll turn those lights off. We'll turn the inboard landing lights on, we'll turn the strobes on, make sure that everything else is set. We'll have that pack to off and uh, just double check I've done everything. Again, taking my eye off the ball just for a second here. Down here. That's looking good. So the only remaining item is the auto thrust to turn on. Uh, we'll arm that once we're entering the runway. Uh, on the Airbus, when you select a takeoff thrust setting, it'll bring the uh, auto thrust in automatically. So we are cleared to take off. No traffic on approach. Uh, we check that out the window, obviously. Check on the TCAS system as well. But uh, there's no AI uh, turned on in this sim, so we're quite safe. Lining up, I'll put the auto thrust on, uh, or arm it, I should say. Everything else is looking good. So if there's no reason to stop on the runway, we'll uh, we'll not. We'll just uh, line the aircraft up. What I'll do is I'll stand the thrust levers up, looking for about 70% uh, N1 as we come around here. Slight forward pressure on the controls, and uh, push the toga button. There's 80 knots, the response is check. V1, rotate. 
positive climb. Gear up. Just follow the flight directors. So above 400 feet, I can engage uh, LNAV. Still flying manually. And there's the thrust reduction altitude. The commands are uh, just uh, climb thrust. I'll put the autopilot in to make life easier because we're single pilot here. And I'll increase the speed to 200 knots. I'll talk about that in just a second. But as we're accelerating, uh, I'll clean up uh, to flaps one. Normally, as you're passing uh, 190 knots, you clean up to flap zero. I'm going to stay at uh, flap one today because there's a 200 knot restriction around the first corner here. Thrust back, so what we'll do is turn on the uh, first air conditioning pack. Make sure the aircraft's doing what it should. It's N1 mode, NCP speed, LNAV with uh, Command A. A few seconds for the air conditioning to uh, sort itself out, then we'll put the other pack on as well. So turn in the corner, I'm now good to increase the speed. I'll go to, to 10 knots, that's minimum clean, minimum clean, and we're accelerating, so flap zero. While we're coming around the corner as well, I'll just synchronise this uh, heading bug with the uh, heading I expect to fly. There's flap zero, no lights, aircraft's climbing quite well, so we can uh, do some of the after takeoff items. Landing gears up and off, RTO is selected off, and the ignition or finish with that, so it goes back to off. So, 210 knots. Why 210 knots and not 250 knots, as we could do below 10,000 feet? Well, the reason being, uh, I'm going the wrong way in simple terms. Gatwick's behind us. Uh, I want to be climbing up to an altitude that lets me pass over the Alps and hope the air traffic will give me a shortcut. So by keeping the speed back, the aircraft will climb just that little bit quicker. It's also important to synchronise the, the heading. On the Airbus, when you're in a managed navigation mode, uh, the equivalent to LNAV, the heading window is uh, blank. There's nothing in there. And when you want heading, you pull the knob and it comes up with the heading you're currently flying. It's really straightforward. On the 737, it's uh, a little bit more manual. But it's important to keep it aligned, and I'll show you why in just a second. So by this point, we'd normally have uh, changed frequency a couple of times, at least gone from the tower controller to the uh, terrain approach controller, and then on towards Milan. At this time in the morning, it's nice and quiet. You might get straight to Milan. And if they're really feeling generous, they maybe give you a, an early turn as well. Looking outside. You can see why we've turned this way. All that terrain behind us, there's the airport we departed from. And uh, we couldn't make that left turn. I really want to be going up this way, but uh, we've got to climb above the terrain. So approaching uh, flight level 100 or 10,000 feet equivalent. Another couple of checks today. I want to make sure the aircraft's pressurising first and foremost. There we go, the cabin's down there at uh, 2,000 feet. So that's a good thing. Uh, and I'll turn off the uh, landing lights. Again, that's a low priority task, not something you'd ever uh, not fly the aircraft to turn off the lights. It doesn't make any difference. If you forget the lights on the Airbus, it uh, rattles a little bit. The uh, lights protrude out into airflow. But uh, on the Boeing, they're flush mounted. It's not really any dramas at all. Turning onto that course 403, we can see the fixed line we've got there out towards Serlo. And on the first officer's nav display, I can see that it's a, a good uh, gross error check there as well. It's centralised on the CDI. Milan Control are feeling generous, so they're going to give us that uh, right turn direct MATOG. So I'll put MATOG to head the flight plan, check the nav display. Now it's giving us a left turn, and I want to turn right. If I turn left, I'll go straight towards those hills there. So I'm going to make sure the heading's aligned, go into heading mode, and start the turn to the right. That's why aligning the heading is, is critical every single time. So once it gives us a, still asking for a left turn at the moment, once it gives us that right turn, I can push execute and go back to LNAV. And just uh, 2,000 feet below the platform, we've got quite a rate of climb on at the moment. So what I'm going to do is reduce that VS down to around uh, 
1,000 feet per minute and use that opportunity to speed up. The reason I'm reducing the uh, VS uh, down to 1,000 is you, one of the reasons you'll be capped at a level is with traffic crossing above. So by keeping that VS nice and low, it means you're not likely to generate a TCAS uh, event for the other traffic. I let the aircraft accelerate. It was uh, planning on something like what 280, 283 knots for the climb. We'll go for 280 selected there. I'm still uh, below the terrain. The terrain comes up to about uh, 17,000 feet or so. But uh, we're in good conditions. Just 1,000 feet to go. Speed's increasing. Let's have a look at it, see how it looks. There you go. It's a lovely model of the 737 300. There's Turin Airport. All that work we've done so far, we've actually got further away from Gatwick than when we started off. But we're in good shape. We're going to turn towards the Alps now and climb up to approximately 36,000 feet. So, Milan is going to give us a further climb now, up to flight level 280. Just to get us above the terrain, what I can do is uh, go back to level change and then I'll bring the uh, speed back. And to maintain that 250 knots that I've commanded now, the aircraft's going to pitch up. That'll give it a really good rate of climb just to get above the terrain. It's all going the right way. And then I can reselect now, uh, well, I could either dial the speed up or just go to VNAV. Increases the speed target, lowers the nose, and I'm above that, uh, all that mountainous terrain ahead of us. So we're in good shape for the, uh, the uh, initial part of the climb. That's all the, uh, or most of the manoeuvring done. Just synchronize that heading bug again. A lot of it task prioritization uh, commercial flying. Do the important stuff, fly the airplane, and then do the secondary tasks. Nice smooth flight at the moment, so I can turn the seatbelt signs off, let the customers get up and uh, wander around. Quick check on the overhead panel to make sure it's all looking like it should. Aircraft still pressurizing. That's a good thing. look outside. One of the great things about this sim is uh, if you've not watched my introduction video um, I give you a little bit of a rundown on the system and the reason for doing this but uh, this is the HD Mesh uh, version 3. It's really uh, it's really quite good. Uh, it looks almost exactly like what it looks like in real life uh, and with the OpenStreetMap derived uh, ground textures it's pretty good. Remember I said Turin Airport was to the north of the city? Well there's the airport uh, there, there's the city it's not uh, photorealistic in that these fields don't actually look like that, but to be honest I can forgive it that because the terrain looks really, really good. Uh, and from jet cruising altitudes, you're not navigating by individual fields anyway. What you're looking for is the big picture stuff. And look at, uh, look at the colour in the sky, look at how beautiful it looks out there. Routing towards Montblanc now. Through flight level 200, another curve. Uh, set of checks to do. Just double check uh, that the aircraft is still pressurising. It's a good climb rate on the uh, cabin. We've got everything set correctly. All the bleeds are there. Cabin temperatures, so it's about 22-23 uh, degrees. We turn the temperatures down just a, a little bit, 21 degrees. There was always uh, some poor person down the back that uh, got into the aircraft a little bit nervous flying, forgot to take the jacket off and now feeling just that a little bit sick sitting down the back of the aircraft. Turn the temperature down just to try and keep them happy. I jest, but uh, it's uh, flying commercially with uh, customers on board. So much of the job involves uh, looking after your passengers as well as uh, flying the aircraft. This early in the morning, there's probably not much traffic ahead of us towards the uh, Swiss airspace. So if we're lucky and the Milan controllers are feeling generous, maybe give us an early transfer to the Swiss controllers. Uh, when they do, invariably, we get another climb. So climb now to flight level 360. And uh, if we had quite a circuitous routing, uh, the Swiss would almost certainly clear us direct uh, to a, a closer 
waypoint to the direct track. In this case, the track uh, we've set the aircraft for is about as direct as it can be, so no dramas there. So let's make the nav display a little bit more useful. We'll increase the range, see what we can see out there. There's uh, Kukev. You can still see some of the terrain indicating on there. This is the uh, top of climb. There's Mont Blanc. Uh, what we can do is put some more fixes in just to verify that. So we're finished with the CSL. I'll put in Moblo, which is very close to Mont Blanc. There we go. Let's see if the terrain sweeps again. Uh, I'll also put in Aosta, just for curiosity more than anything else. Not any practical purpose in having those on there. One of the things that uh, some people complain about with X-Plane is the manipulators that with uh, Flight Sim uh, 2004 and Flight Sim 10, you can use the scroll wheel to change things like the uh, the courses here. Uh, whereas on X-Plane you have to basically grab and uh, drag side to side. Uh, I really don't mind to be honest, this, what we would say back home is it swings and roundabouts. With the 3D cockpit uh, that this aircraft has, being able to hold the right mouse button and pan around and use the scroll wheel to zoom in and zoom out as you pan, whilst, uh, it, it's really pretty useful, it makes that 3D cockpit uh, fully usable. Whereas on Flight Sim 2004 it's a little bit more restricted in how you can move it around, so I tended to prefer flying with the uh, 2D panels. And if the, uh, using the scroll wheel for the zoom is the price we pay for the, uh, the scroll wheel manipulators then, I'm happy with that. Although rumours are the uh, scroll wheels are coming to, to X-Plane as well. I'll put that first officer's nav display onto uh, map as well. So there's uh, Aosta there, that was the, uh, one of the waypoints uh, we drew. Let's have a look, see if we can see it. It should be down in the valley here. Move our head around a little bit, see if we can see it. With a bit of luck, it should just behind this, uh, just behind this hill here. Aosta Valley Airport, it's uh, only 1500 metres long and it's a 5 degree uh, approach down the ILS. It's kind of an offset ILS procedure and uh, I've never been in there in real life. It's a little bit too short and a little bit too tight to operate uh, an Airbus or a, a jet transport in there. There was a BizJet operator in there uh, and you start the approach from about 15,000 feet out towards uh, Biela behind us, behind uh, or beside Milan, Malpensa. So it looks like quite a fascinating airport to, to have a play with in X-Plane. There it is down there. And this is a, a little backwater airfield. Uh, it is buildings and details on there. You can see the road along there, there's the, a railway. It's really quite detailed for what is essentially an airport that uh, very few people will have heard of. Everything seems to be going quite well on the inside of the jet, so we'll just have a look outside and see, uh, see what we can see. So, this pass here, this uh, takes you up towards the uh, Mont Blanc tunnel. There's Mont Blanc here. This is Aguil de Midi. Uh, there's a little cable car that comes up here. Uh, I believe that's Aguil de Midi. And uh, there's a, a little glass here. You can ski all the way down into the Chamonix Valley on the other side. It's called the Mer de Glace. I believe that's the Sea of Ice. When we get a little bit closer, you can see the road there. We'll have a look at the Chamonix side as well. Beyond, we can see uh, Lake Geneva, some of the terrain around Geneva. And uh, panning around here, there's the Osta Valley down there. Absolutely beautiful lighting conditions. Looking back, terrain is uh, around here. There's the River Po. This old area here is called the Po Valley, just on the southern side of the Alps. And this is this is a set, this is free scenery in X Plane 10. There's no cost involved to have this HD mesh version 3. Uh, and it's it's spectacular. It's uh, it's not seasonal texture, as I said. It's perpetual uh, spring conditions here. But to be honest, it's it's nice enough to look at. And if seasonal textures come at some point in the future, then so much the better. But as it is, it's for flying a jet over the top at 36,000 feet. It's it's really quite nice. I'll maybe have a look at doing some low-level VFR stuff in uh, in some of the Swiss and Austrian uh, low-level routes as well. Excellent. 
So we're just uh, a few thousand feet off the cruising level at the moment. The machine's going to calculate the uh, top of descent for us there. It's around uh, 440. Uh, it's currently 350, so that's about 50, 48 minutes, probably about 45 minutes in the cruise we'll get on this leg. That's uh, quite generous, really, quite a, a relaxed uh, cruise segment for a short haul crew here. Once we get to the uh, top of climb, hopefully the cabin crew would have brought the uh, breakfast in for us. We'll have a chat about the arrival into Gatwick, have a do the brief for the Gatwick arrival, have a look at the notes for the next destination we'll be off to, and uh, send some messages off to the company to request the uh, fuel for the next sector and notify them of any special loads we've got or any uh, customer issues notify them of any uh, reduced mobility passengers that sort of thing it's a really really nicely modeled uh, simulation this one of the best things about it is uh, what I set off to do with this channel is show that it can be enjoyable to operate the aircraft um, and you can increase your enjoyment by moving away from the official procedures just a, a little bit you're operating uh, using a, a keyboard a mouse and a joystick uh, complicated aircraft that's designed to be operated by two crew with a full tactile set of switches and levers in front of them so with a few simplifications and how you operate it, you can make your, your simming experience really quite enjoyable. But the main thing about that is that doesn't mean the sim model itself needs to be any less detailed. Quite the opposite, in fact, because this aircraft is designed so well, uh, this, this sim is built so well that it actually mirrors how the aircraft flies. And the aircraft is uh, designed to be flown in an intuitive, straightforward manner. So if you've got a simulation model that doesn't have all the features quite correct uh, and doesn't behave as you might expect it to behave, that's going to be quite frustrating. This aircraft is uh, exactly as, uh, this simulation of an aircraft is almost exactly as, uh, as Boeing designed it based on my experience of the uh, 737 procedures trainer. So it's really quite enjoyable. There's 1,000 feet to go. Uh, have a look outside again. Just passing over the... Uh, Mont Blanc, there's the Chamonix Valley, you can see down here, that's the road as it comes out, the Mont Blanc uh, Tunnel, Chamonix Valley here, all the way around towards, uh, down towards Geneva, there's a little uh, general aviation field down there, I believe it's called Animas, I uh, don't know about the pronunciation, don't quote me on that, this is Lake Geneva, the airfield's around here, uh, the approach for runway 05 comes in over this train here, and runway 23, it's a place called Sompre, a VOR here, and then it's about a 50 mile final down the valley towards Geneva. That's about it for this video. Uh, you don't really want to see me fly at straight and level on autopilot for another 45 minutes or so. Uh, just have another quick look around. We've pretty much seen everything there is to see uh, for this leg of the flight. I do hope you enjoyed watching. I hope it's been uh, entertaining and uh, informative for you. If you get any questions, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the video. What would you like to see covered in more detail? Uh, what could I go a little bit quicker for? And if there's anything, any content requests, anything you'd like to see, I'd be very happy to look at that as well. Uh, next video hopefully will be the uh, Freeware Let 410. Uh, that's a fantastic little model that uh, I've downloaded as well. In the meantime, we'll watch the uh, 737 uh, disappear off into the uh, daylight here. And I'll say thanks very much for watching and uh, I'll hopefully speak to you again soon.